Hi, welcome back to Rust 101. This is the third video, and today we're going to be talking about Rust's ownership model, which is about which is all about memory, how um, things get stored, uh, where they kind of when they move around, um, when they get deleted, stuff like that. Um, in some languages, you don't have to think about um, what what memory is being used and how it's being used. Um, in Rust, you do, and that's really cool for a number of reasons. One, it helps you be absolutely sure what's happening, when things are going to happen, and stuff like that. Um, and two, it it um, it allows you to write code that, in some cases, can be much more efficient, run much faster. Um, but it does come with some complications. Um, and it's the one bit of Rust that is quite unfamiliar from some other languages, especially languages um, with sort of dynamic memory management. Um, so it's going to take a little bit of getting your head around, and that's why I've split off this part of this um, the slides into a separate video. Um, we're going to talk about what the stack is, what the heap is, um, and we're going to take our time over this um, because if it's a new concept, you need to you need to um, get hold of it. You don't need to get hold of it immediately. Um, just in just in this video, we will be continue talking about this stuff through future videos. Um, but yeah, we're going to do the stack and the heap and memory management basically. Um, all right, but let's start off by just jumping back to a slide uh, from the previous video and just apologizing because uh, uh, it went a bit wrong. Where is it? Yeah, here. So yeah, just to say apologies. Um, in the previous video, it said string new here. Uh, it should have said string from. Uh, uh, sorry for the mistake. Okay, jumping back. So first of all, we'll just review some of the stuff that we looked at in the last video. Um, very quickly, just because we're going to need these ideas um, for this stuff. First of all, scope. So we've got this idea that um, a variable is either in scope or out of scope. You can see that before the let statement on line three, we can't talk about name, like on line two, you can't talk about name yet because we haven't declared it yet, so it's not yet in scope. Um, and then name stays in scope until you get to the the curly bracket at the end. So variables in scope, if uh, the, the curly brackets, the, the braces surrounding it, um, uh, while it's while the braces are surrounding it. So here's an, here's another little example with two variables, i and j. So you can see that i is in scope right from the beginning of the program. Um, j doesn't become in scope until later on inside the curly brackets of the if. Um, and then uh, when you get to the end of those curly brackets, j goes out of scope because it was declared inside the curly brackets of the if. So you can't use J on the last line. You can't use J on line seven because it's gone out of scope, right? Fairly straightforward. Um, all right, so now let's talk about memory. Um, and let's look at this diagram on the right and let's talk about these two things called the stack and the heap. And most of this video is gonna be about that. So don't expect to you know, get your head around it on just this slide. But essentially you can think of the stack as being kind of at the top at the beginning of the memory or the top of the memory and you think of the heap as being kind of the rest um, so often the heap's pretty big and often the stack's relatively small uh, and the thing to think about is the stack is a, a bit of memory where it's very straightforward to find the next bit you're going to use so um, if we want a bit more stack we just make some more just below the bit we were already using and when we finished with it we just get rid of that and go back so that we've got um, the the previous bit of stack left. Whereas on the heap, if you want a new bit of heap memory, you have to kind of go and find an area that's free. There might be some chunks of free memory or there might be a bit above here that you can use. Um, and then you get hold of it and you use it and then later you you let go of it and then at that point uh, there'll be like a new chunk of free memory in the middle. So the heap is kind of scattered all around this uh, this memory here, which is normally huge compared with the where the stack is. Um, but there'll be little bits and bobs that are free, little bits and bobs that are used up. Whereas the stack is always just constant, free, uh, like com completely used up from the top. And you just, any what time you want anymore, you add it just below. And in particular, what the stack is used for is to hold onto the memory that's being used in a function. So you can see the first bit of stack memory that gets taken is for all the variables that are used in the main function. And then the next bit of stack that you get hold of is for when you call um, the fib function and you pass in an argument of six in our, in our example program we looked at last time. And then um, as part of that um, that function call of, of 
trying to work out what fib6 is we actually work out what fib5 is because it's a recursive function so we essentially anytime we call another function from inside one function we take on another bit of stack for the variables of that so you can see that every time i call a function from within another function we take on another chunk of stacks for all the variables that are used for that function call uh, so that's like a very quick introduction to the stack but the point is that the, the the stack is where you take bits of memory that you're just using right now to, to handle this function and once you've finished handling that function or even that um, part of a function um, you, you throw away that bit of the stack um, and everything that was being used there it gets deleted the memory gets removed um, so we're starting to get into like when things get um, like when variables get uh, well, when values get created and removed from memory uh, and like I said in other languages you don't have to think about it uh, in C and C++ you do this this idea of the stack in the heap is there and um, has a similar uh, pattern to it but Rust gives you a lot more um, power of, of, of being sure what's happening um, all right. So the other thing, the uh, stuff that the, these these bullets are talking over on the left, is that the very most of the variables we've been talking about, the values we've been talking about so far, are so-called copy. They're of a type called copy, which means when you say x equals y, um, then the memory that's used for y gets copied. So now you've got two copies of it: one for x and one for y. Uh, and that's a very simple and um, way of working with small values. But if you did that with huge values or with values that you want to stick around and modify parts of them and then look at them later, um, that's going to be a problem. So um, we generally only things that are quite small and simple are copy, which means they get copied when you say y equals x or x equals y. Um, also, um, as we'll see, things that live on the stack need to be, you need to know exactly what size they're going to be so that when you, when you call that function, um, you know how much stack space to take for that function uh, you need to know that at compile time so a lot of things are not the size of them is not known at compile time it's known much later on when the program is actually running uh, in that case all that stuff is going to end up on the heap so that we can resize um, or go and find another bit of memory somewhere else to, to hold on to it so those are the kind of basic concepts of um, stack and heap and we're going to get into those a bit more and figure out how they really work about now all right so uh, just stepping back slightly, um, what is a computer program? What does it do? Well, essentially, it's a list of instructions for a computer um, telling the computer to do things. And most of the things that the computer is doing is manipulating memory, like changing the numbers or whatever that are stored somewhere um, uh, inside the computer. So we need ways of knowing, knowing which bit of memory can we, if we need a new bit of memory, where can we find it? So that's where we end up with the stack and the heap. So this is just another diagram illustrating almost exactly the same stuff we saw um, a couple of slides ago, just showing you um, how we can think about memory, whether it's really like this is perhaps um, not really relevant, but you can think about memory as being the stack is at the top and it has a bunch of frames and then the heap is at the bottom, which is like a chaotic um, heap of bits of memory that are being used, whereas the stack is all like continuously used, like I said. Uh, and the stack can grow and shrink um, uh, and we have this thing called the stack pointer which essentially tells us where is the bottom or the top of the stack yeah the the other thing about the stack is that we often talk about pushing things onto the stack uh, and we often think about pushing it down in these diagrams when you push things onto the stack they um, sorry I mean sometimes we think of pushing them down from the top and like the stack gets deeper down because of that um, in this diagram, we're putting we're pushing things onto the bottom of the stack. But it, it like either way, it's a bit of memory where you can only the only thing only thing you can delete is the last thing you added on. If you see what I mean. So what happens is um, here at the moment in this diagram, we've got two functions that have been called frame one and frame two, or, or two bits of two chunks of stack that have been uh, used up so far. And then when we add another bit of memory that we need on the stack, then we add another frame. And the stack pointer moves down to point at um, the the bottom of the stack. So yeah, as as this piece of text is saying, um, 
the the, the stack frame is exactly enough memory for the the stuff that uh, that's happening in this function call that we're working in. When that function call has finished, when when that bit of code has finished running, we just get rid of frame number three and go back to the stack pointer pointing at the bottom of frame number two. Um, so the stack is really simple for the computer to know which bit of memory um, am I going to um, when I need some more memory, where do I find it? And when I finish with my memory, how do I get rid of it? It doesn't. It, there's no work to be done um, to do that. Whereas on the heap, if you need a bit of new memory, you've got to go find a piece of memory, and when you free it up, you've got to um, like mark it as free in some way. And it gets a lot more complicated. Uh, so the stack is faster to use to grab hold of memory, but it has these limitations that you have to know exactly at compile time, you have to know exactly how much memory you want from the stack. Um, yeah, so as I was just saying, um, the size of things on the stack have to be known at compile time, um, and if I don't know what size it is, how, how can I take the right chunk of memory on the stack? Um, what if the user's typing stuff in and it might be bigger or smaller? Then we can't just um, like pre-allocate the amount of space we want on the stack. I mean, it, technically you can, right, by taking loads and loads of memory on the stack um, and then only using the bit of it that you, you need. And then some in some styles of programming, like in embedded programming, you might do that. You might take a great big chunk of stack at the beginning and then just uh, use it. Um, but it's pretty inconvenient. So that's not the way we're working most of the time. Um, all right, so um, the stack is great. If you can use the stack, it's very fast. But sometimes you need to use the heap, um, either because stuff needs to live a long time or it needs to be a variable size. And the point of the heap is it is a, it's a pile and it's a mess um, uh, because the, the, the chunks of memory that you use could be all different shapes and sizes. Um, and you, you need to search through the heap for an area that's big enough for whatever chunk of memory you want to use next. Uh, and then you need to free it up again. Um, and it's hard to use. Um, and um, various programming languages have various ways of working with the heap. So in C and C++, you ask for a bit of heap memory when you want it, and the, the system goes off and finds it for you, and then uh, when you finish with it, you ask for it to be deleted again, and then, then it gets removed, and again, the system looks after actually doing that for you. Um, but you manually have to tell it, I want, I want this piece of memory removed. In C++, you've got some mechanisms that help you with that, where you kind of tie a little bit of memory on the stack um, to say, when this bit of memory is getting deleted, please can you go off and now and find um, the memory, the relevant memory on the heap. Um, and in some cases in C++, that means that you don't have to think quite so much about the heap. Um, in Rust, that, that tie between a little bit of memory that's on the stack and when that gets deleted, it also cleans up some other related stuff on the heap is kind of the fundamental structure in Rust for um, making sure that there's never some stuff on the heap that you forget about or that you think you've still got access to when um, actually it's been deleted and stuff like that. So those are the kinds of mistakes you can make in C and C++ that get, you get covered in Rust so that it's almost impossible to make those mistakes. In, in using safe Rust, at least, it's impossible to make those mistakes. Um, in other languages, you might be wondering, how does this, like, how does JavaScript or Java or C Sharp or Python deal with this stuff? Why don't I have to think about it? And the, the, the main answer is um, they, use, they use the heap a lot and they look after all this stuff for you. So whenever you do some stuff, um, they, they find some memory for you and then they figure out when you've stopped using it. Instead of you being explicit about when you've stopped using it, using the scope um, in a language like Python, um, it basically keeps a list of everyone who's using that memory and when there's no one on that list anymore, it'll tidy it up. Um, but that takes a bit of work um, for the program to do that work for you. In Rust, instead, we're very clear about who um, owns the stuff on the heap, and then it's quite straightforward then to say, well, that but that owner has gone out of scope, so um, we're going to delete it right now. OK, so let's just go back over scopes again. Um, so this is exactly the same example we saw earlier. Um, so I and J have different scopes. J is only in scope inside that curly bracket. Um, uh, but what's, uh, what we didn't know before and we now know is that I and J in this example are copy because they're both I32s, which is a very simple value, which means that when you say on line four, let J equal I, you're taking a copy of the memory 
uh, of j. So that means if you then changed j, if it was mutable, uh, i wouldn't change. They're completely separate copies of that value 10. Um, but uh, so that's quite a simple way of dealing with memory. Um, but if if the if i and j were huge values that you we really don't want to copy, um, this wouldn't this wouldn't work. And the default in Rust for most values is that they're not copied. So uh, this is just taking it um, taking it right down to the detail. Imagine we've got a variable called x which holds the value five, um, and then we say y equals x um, because this is an i32 which is copy. Um, y will now be a copy of x. So on line 3, we can still print x. This is what happens when we run this program. It's, it prints out a 5 at the end. That's what, what this is, because x is 5. Um, so that's how, um, that's how it works for variables that are copy. You can say y equals x, and then you can still use x. That's all we're trying to say here. Um, but what about this program? So this looks really, really similar, right? We create a string, s1. Uh, and then we say s2 equals s1, um, and then we print out the value of s1, so the first thing. So what happens when we run that? Well, what happens is it won't run, it won't compile in fact, um, because, um, because we've got this error message here. So you can see that these programs are really similar, but they work differently. The reason they work differently is because i32s are copy and strings are not copy. Uh, and you see this comment that we saw earlier? We're going to explain what that means now. And, and that is the key to why this is different, why these two examples are different. So in this in this line of code, line two, um, y, y equals x means take a copy of x and put it in y. Whereas on this line of code, this means um, s2 should take ownership of the value that's held in s1. And S1 can no longer be used after that. And that's because uh, strings are not copy. There is a way of asking to take a copy, which we'll look at in a second. But if you don't ask to take a copy, you take ownership. You like move the, the ownership of that value from S1 to S2. And that's what this compile error is saying. It's saying um, you're trying to borrow a moved value. So here's where we're trying to borrow it. But by borrow here, we'll talk more about what borrowing means. But essentially for now, uh, I'm trying to use it. So it's trying to borrow S1 here, trying to use S1 here, after ownership has already gone away from it because there was a move. So look, it says um, move occurs because S1 has type string, which does not implement copy. So that's what I was saying. Whoops. Uh, and then here's where the move happens. On this line three, uh, when we say that S1, when we say that S2 equals S1, that's when we're moving it and saying, now you take ownership of this thing. So in terms of stack and heap, let's think about this briefly. Um, so essentially, S1 is a variable. And because it's inside a function, it's on the stack. But it also owns some memory on the heap. And un how that actually works underneath, uh, you don't know. All you know is S1 has, the, has ownership of some um, heap allocated memory. That's what this is saying, which it owns. And when S1 goes out of scope, that memory will get deleted, except in this case, S2 takes ownership of it. So it's actually now when S2 goes out of scope that the memory will get deleted. And we're no longer allowed to use S1 because S1 has kind of lost its all of its ownership rights because S2 took hold of ownership. It's going to take a while to get your head around this stuff. Um, and whether that was an, a good explanation, I do not know. But we're going to we're going to continue, uh, and there's more slides that are going to help us get our heads around this in this video and later. Okay, um, so you might ask why why are strings, which are kind of a quite a fundamental type of uh, thing, difficult to work with when numbers are easy to work with? Well, maybe that's a mischaracterization, but anyway, let's go with it. Um, the main reason uh, here is because strings can grow and shrink in size, um, so they can't just go on the stack. Um, they have to go, they have to have this linked bit of uh, memory that's on the heap, which is where these actual letters get held when they when you uh, after you constructed your string. Um, uh, and because it might change size, it can't go on the stack. It has to go on the heap. Um, and so someone has to own it, and ownership can be transferred in this way. All right, so um, let's, let's just go through some thoughts about ownership. So um, 
Yeah, there's, um, when you're talking about stuff that's on the stack, there's only ever one owner, and as we've seen already, that owner can also like own linked bits of the heap. Uh, yeah, when you go out of, st uh, of scope, um, you get removed from the stack, and any uh, linked stuff on the heap get cleaned up as well. Um, and this, you may have possibly have heard this phrase, move semantics, which basically means um, when you when you say S two equals S one. Um, ownership transfers, and it's like the it's like the value moved from S S one into S two, um, and uh, so yeah, now S two uh, that variable is responsible for cleaning it up. Um, and this this might sound like a load of hassle, but what it actually is is kind of formalizing some rules that have gradually grown up in especially in C plus plus around how to deal with um, stuff that's stored on the heap. The best way that we've found to deal with stuff that's kind of randomly scattered around the heap is to have it always be linked to something that's on the stack because it's really easy to think about um, stuff on the stack and who um, when, when it gets cleaned up. So we link um, stuff and that's what string is. String is like something that you hold on the, on the stack but it's got this linked memory um, which gets cleaned up um, from the heap when that variable gets, um, goes out of scope on the stack. So here's a program. Um, and um, w it, it demonstrates the fact that um, so far we've only seen uh, mem ownership getting transferred when we, when we do a let statement. We had let s1 equal s2. But transferring um, ownership also happens when you call a function. So we create a string, s1. And then we call a function calculate length and we pass in s1 as an argument to that function. And you can see the calculate length function takes in a string as its argument and returns the length of that string, which is in this case a u size. It does that by calling the len method. Um, and then we print out the length, uh, the string and the length. So here we're doing a print len statement with two bit, two curly braces to say substitute stuff in. And the stuff we're substituting in is s1 and len, which is the answer we got back from calculate length. So what do you think is going to happen when we try to compile this program? Hint, it's not going to work. Um, here's the here's the error message we get, and it's the same type of error message we saw before. Borrow of a moved value s1. So here, here we're trying to use s1, trying to borrow it um, in order to print it out, um, but it already got moved here when we called the function. So this function took ownership of this string and put it um, put the ownership into the uh, this variable inside it called s. When we got to the end of this function, that memory got deleted because it had ownership of, the, uh, of it. So now we can't use s1 because s1 doesn't own it anymore. So we can't use it here. Um, so that seems inconvenient. What can we do about it? Well, one thing we could do is move it back again. So th this is a really overcomplicated, weird example, but it kind of, without talking about borrowing yet, it gives us a way of kind of solving this problem. So I want to take you through it. So we make S1, then we pass it in to calculate length, um, and a calculate length uses it and returns it back again at, along with a length. So it returns us a length and a string, um, and then we can print it all out. So what that looks like inside calculate length is that we take in a string as a, one of our parameters, and our return type is is the length, which is a u size, and the string back again. This is a tuple type. We saw that in the last video. Um, so here's how it actually does it. It calls len on s, and it and it returns s as well. So we're returning back two things in this tuple, which we get, we pick up back again here. And now we're able to use s1 and len because although we passed ownership into calculate length, it then passed it back again here in, as a part of its return value. So now we can use it. It could have passed us something else back, but in this case, it passed us the same thing back. Um, so yeah, now it works. You can say the length of hello is five because you are allowed to use S1 again because we got given back ownership of it. So that, that like this example is silly. You wouldn't do this. Um, but it, you definitely would sometimes pass ownership into a function and then pass ownership back again at the end of a function or pass ownership of something else um, back at the end of a function. Um, so the things can move in and out of function calls in this way. 
All right, whoops. Um, okay, so here's something you might do. And again, this is also not a very sensible thing to do. But what you can do also is clone things. So a lot of things, almost, no, a lot of things that you come across um, that are have some component, some area, part of them stored on the heap, like a string, will have a clone method, which means actually take a copy and make a copy of the stuff that's stored on the heap as well, so that I get a completely new independent variable that I can use. Um, that when I change it, it doesn't change the original one. Um, so th this is different. Yeah, so in, whereas things like integers uh, are copy, which means you get a clone every time you, you pass them or, or uh, assign them, um, with clone, you're, you get the same kind of idea, but only when you explicitly ask for it by saying dot clone on your on your variables, which is what we're doing here. So um, yeah, could it, and that the reason why there's an explicit function call is because it might be expensive. Uh, if we had a huge string and we called clone on it, it would copy, it would make a whole new chunk of memory on the heap. Um, and this is not a great way of solving this problem, but it's another way of solving the problem. We get we make a string called x. And then we call this get length function, and we instead of passing x in, we pass in a clone of x, uh, and then that means we're allowed to use x later because we never we never gave away ownership of x. We gave away ownership of a clone of x, and in here this argument is that clone of x, and all we do is ask for its length and return it, and then this clone this uh, the value arg gets deleted at the end of this function, but that's okay because it wasn't the same thing that was owned by x. It was a clone of it. Um, so we can still use x later. Uh, this is like a terrible way of doing it, but uh, it kind of works. Oops. Okay, so um, in, in both this video and the previous video, we've, we've shown you loads of syntax, and we've tried to show you um, the idea of ownership. And what's missing out, um, by the way, is how to like do that, um, that, that chunk of code we were just looking at in a sensible way. Because the sensible way is not to pass ownership, um, it's to borrow. And we'll talk about what borrowing means, but essentially it means you can you let someone else use your variable for a bit, um, but you still own it. Um, so I think the key thing that you need to uh, understand from this video is um, this idea of the stack and the heap and everything that goes on the stack, you need to know exactly what size it has at compile time, but it can be linked to some memory on the heap, which gets looked after. So yeah, I, you need to know, you have to think about memory in Rust. Um, there's these two types of memory, the chaotic heap and the nice, sensible, structured, ordered stack. Um, and that variables own bits of memory. Uh, and only one thing can own one bit of memory um, in general. And there are some structures that allow for shared ownership, which we'll get to. Um, but the kind of basic way that Rust code works is that one thing owns one piece of memory um, and uh, you can transfer ownership um, by either by saying x equals y or something like that or by passing it into a function or returning it back from a function that, that hands over ownership of your bit of memory from one bit to another. Um, this might all seem, as I said, incredibly overcomplicated, but uh, it actually is a way of getting real control over what's happening without the possibility of forgetting to delete some memory or accidentally deleting some memory and trying to use it later, which is the kind of problems you can get in other languages. Okay, um, so don't forget to try out the exercises. There are links in the in the show notes. Um, uh, do leave comments on these videos asking any questions. Uh, do work together on it. Um, I think I will probably, my next video will probably be me running through some or all of the exercises for um, that go with these slides. Um, maybe possibly on a live stream. So do leave a comment if you would like to participate by um, coming on to live stream. Um, I hope this wasn't too confusing. I would recommend the Rust book um, as just another explanation of this stuff. Um, especially if if, the, if this is going too fast or is too like diving into uh, like computer science concepts, um, check out the Rust book, um, which you can read for free online. I'll see, uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, it explains the stack and the heap um, in different ways. You probably need a few different explanations of it, um, and I think all of this will come together a lot more when we start going through 
um, real code and seeing how it actually works. So if, if it doesn't make any sense yet, um, uh, keep plugging away at it, read different people's explanations, watch different videos. Um, and then my kind of chaotic explanation might eventually start making some sense to you. Um, um, but uh, either way, yeah, see you in the next video where we'll do some exercises, uh, understand these ideas a little bit more deeply. Um, and uh, see you next time.